Well, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen here in Davos, but also um, the people who have been meeting in other regions of the world. The World Economic Forum um, in 2011 created this wonderful group called the Global Shapers, hubs in cities right across the, the world of young people keen to engage and to make change in their cities. And it's a real pleasure this morning to moderate a session thinking about how the, the activities of that Global Shapers group, and in particular, the meetings that they have hosted in countries around the world, can help shape the agenda ahead. So thank you all for being here. I'd like to start by actually bringing in some of the participants in the meetings that the Global Shapers have organized. So we're now going to, we're going to go global and open as we um, as the, as the WEF, I think, is going to be doing over the next few years more and more. And I'm going to go to Bhopal, where we have Tanvi Sundrial um, sitting in warmer weather than, than <laughs> here. But Tanvi, why don't you tell us, um, you know, President Xi Jinping said um, in his speech here at Davos, the fourth industrial revolution is dazzling, but it hasn't yet turned into a driver of economic growth. Now, that's a challenge for all of you um, on screen and in this room. Um, how did your meeting see this issue? How, how do you think Bhopal could use the fourth industrial revolution to move ahead? So when we look at the fourth industrial revolution, it encompasses a lot of things, cyber, physical system integrations, and it is far above just using IT platforms. At this point of time, in India, businesses, institutions, and citizens all are engaged with IT platforms in a very comfortable manner. They are using it every day for service delivery mechanisms to even small things. But if we look at scaling up of artificial technology, artificial intelligence, these things haven't really come up as driving the chain. Especially in India, 26% of internet penetration, the basic infrastructure and the basic investment in human resources and skilling and placing of people in the value chain is of paramount importance and it has to come before or parallelly. Then only we need to harness the impact brought about by this. Revolution. Thank you. That's terrific. So you're saying Bhopal is already enjoying the third industrial revolution, the digital revolution, with, with all its businesses being able to use IT platforms. But the fourth industrial revolution seems too far away at the moment. Is that right? It's not far away. But if you look at the challenges that India faces in terms of its population, in terms of the working mm -hmm. population being added per year, mm -hmm. the diversity and complexity mm -hmm. of the entire country, mm -hmm. and of the state that I live in, of which, mm -hmm. of which Bhopal is the capital city, yep. it is huge. Right. And I think we'll, and we'll come back in a moment to our panelists to ask them whether those big human and capital infrastructure issues that India first needs to deal with whether the fourth industrial revolution can help deal with those. But thank you, Tanvi. Um, let me move to Cabello Moyo, who's sitting in Habarone, Botswana. Why don't you tell us about how this Hi. was seen at your meeting in Botswana? Thank you very much. Um, I think for us, um, it actually created an, an opportunity for us as a country to actually to actually participate um, in something in some in something global. Um, we, we may not be necessarily ready, but I think the nature of the fourth of the fourth in, in industrial revolution is going into uncharted uncharted territory. Um, you know, so I think for us, um, it was it, 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 it gives us an opportunity to 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 be a part of it, to partake. We we also do have challenges. Um, you know, coming from from a uh, developing world, there are issues around. If, Structure around human human capital, um, but I think it is an opportunity for us to actually try and bridge um, bridge the technological gap and also the the, the advancement of um, 
uh, services, basically. Uh, and so, also so, the products, sorry. Mr. So Matthew. can you give us a specific example of how that might work? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, you know, when you look at, um, you know, how how uh, technology usually filters through to the to the African continent, um, you know, we tend to be a little bit later on um, in the race, or, or if, you, if you may put it that way. But then, you know, we also, and I think it was one of the well, one of the panelists actually um, said that, you know, African solutions um, developed by by African people. So when you look at the advent of mobile banking. Um, you know, whereas in, in in Europe and in the Western world, um, um, it's it's more about online banking. But because of the limitations around around infrastructure, um, you know, and 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 the changing of the banking sector, um, and the use of the mobile phone platforms, which I think have have also surpassed um, maybe what uh, they were originally in, in, intended to do in the in the Western um, hemisphere, basically. So, so actually, in some of those areas, Africa has leapfrogged other countries in the uptake of technology. And I guess you're posing the question, can, Africa do, can countries in Africa do this with the fourth industrial revolution technologies? That's a great question Indeed. for us. Thank you very much. Um, let me move to Ashraf Awadi, who's sitting in Tunis, in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. So Ashraf, what did, your, what did your meeting come up with? So mainly we discussed. Uh, the role of youth in the fight against corruption and then the basic, I would say, uh, conclusion that we got of the meeting with was the, the impunity that's somehow reigning in the uh, Tunisian uh, system that this impunity is encouraging more and more the, um, the corrupt to keep uh, using the same uh, old practices that it somehow might, uh, if not tackled, now that might harm the competitiveness of the of the Tunisian market. So we also uh, discussed uh, the role of youth in this and why there is uh, somehow a boycott from youth, not only to um, to civil society but to the public sphere in general. Like not seeing them involved with political parties, not seeing them involved with civil society organizations, and the very few who choose the path of um, entrepreneurship are really starting. Uh, struggling actually with an archaic system. You've been mentioning the, the fourth industrial revolution. I'm not even sure we can speak about the third in Tunisia. We're still a bit away of a digital era in terms of the Tunisian administration. I mean, even in terms of payments and e-banking, uh, I think we're still a little bit behind. So if I heard you correctly, that's really surprising what you're saying. Because we think of Tunisia as a country whose revolution occurred because of social media and digital means, True. but you're saying that the youth of today are turning their backs on technology? Mm. Uh, unfortunately, um, it's true that the dexterity of youth when it comes to social media is a way, way better than uh, the one that the official uh, part of the government is using. Like, you still get uh, administrations with no websites, you still get um, people unable to pay, um, uh, to pay using uh, their online uh, credit, the credit cards online, you still find uh, Tunisians not even able to have an international credit card. So even though when we talk about an ecosystem in general, for, for a young entrepreneur, he would de definitely struggle to buy a domain for, for, his, for his website. So that's, I see this gap between what the youth are using the, the social media and the internet in general, and what potential is the government uh, giving them or providing them with. So there's that mm -hmm. huge gap that somehow pushing a little bit back those who are trying to innovate or trying to uh, invest uh, in Tunisia. So that's why it's true that we use a lot of social media in terms of resistance and mobilizing, but when we want to build or make or create wealth, uh, that's not really an asset that we have. So your, your concern is that only the very, very wealthy and those with a lot of power will be able to use the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution? Um, I don't want to be pessimistic, but sure. we are almost... That's a concern, a, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a big concern mm -hmm. going towards pessimism, mm -hmm. which is a state capture by mm -hmm. the very top mm -hmm. economic elite mm -hmm. that's killing the competitiveness, mm -hmm. and also it's killing the creativity mm -hmm. for so many young people mm -hmm. that you don't... The ecosystem mm -hmm. is improving, to be honest, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we need more mm -hmm. reforms, institutional and structural reform to be able to say that this is a fair market for everyone that we can play with. So 
having an idea, yeah. having a small budget right. you can start with, but so and, many institutional challenges. And you know, that has been a, a theme well, you know, that has been discussed both this year at Davos and last year at Davos. You know, if we can do human enhancement and use artificial intelligence in all these ways, who will have access? to these uh, technologies, and we'll pick this up with our panelists as well. Um, but I'd, I'd like to move now to Alexandra Rusakov, who's sitting in Yaroslav in Russia. Alexandra, would you like to tell us about your meeting? Uh, we have a meeting with the students of our universities in Yaroslav. That is actually a city, or better to say, a region with 1 million and 2,700 uh, population. So we have several universities, and we bring most active part of them together, and we are trying to discuss uh, the most uh, interesting um, impacts of the implementation of the fourth uh, industrial revolution principle on the education system that is actually one of the most conservatives in the world, and to find out what the headwinds could be uh, for these implementations and what should be improved in our curriculums and even uh, what new words uh, would come to our accessories and how universities should uh, live in these new uh, circumstances and the new uh, digital environment. And what's your yeah. biggest concern? What's your my biggest? biggest <laughs> my biggest concern is the conservatism <coughs> and my biggest concern is the gap between the interests of the uh, ongoing industrial, industrial improvements and those curriculums that couldn't follow them in the right pace. So what we have to do is to reshuffle, but I to say to reconfirm all the educational system in the region, first of all, and in the federal level. And we have some instruments in Russia. We have a special agency for um, strategic initiatives who can drive all these changes. And uh, we are going to be prepared for that. Uh, That's so quite, so for many of us, that would be surprising because we think of Russia as a country with very good education and research, whether it's in computing science or you know, technology or science. Yes, of course, we are speaking in general and we are speaking locally. So in most mm -hmm. uh, regional universities, we are starting to get prepared to that all. And we have points of excellence as well in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Kazan, in many other cities. But the case is that we should reshuffle the whole system and make a very, very flexible system of education with uh, appropriate academic mobilities, with uh, new educators, with uh, new skills, and that is really a demand from the society and from professional society and from our students as well. And, and so what's the first thing you're going to do to shake up that conservatism and to bring about this change? The first thing I'll do, I'll change myself. <laughs> right. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'd like to come to the panel to, um, to get some commentary on these challenges, to get some answers um, for those who have joined us. And I'd like to come to the audience um, for answers as well, or perhaps further questions. But um, can I start with, um, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting her name, with Tanvi's um, concern, which is, Hold on, before we go to the fourth industrial revolution, what about basic human capital, government services, infrastructure? What about the things we need for economic growth and, and you know, poverty, et cetera, in our country? Can I introduce Beth Novak, who um, is now a professor at Yale University and previously was advising the US government on technology? And the British uh, government. And the British government. And uh, Beth. How do you balance those two things? You're doing governance lab experiments, which are trying to solve some quite practical problems mm -hmm. using technology. What would your answer to Tanvi be about whether the fourth industrial revolution can help? Well, I think you're correct to uh, the remarks that to draw the connection between the importance of effective institutions of governing and unlocking the economic and inclusive potential of technological growth. Mm -hmm. um, this story, this one of combining the learning that comes from machines, the intelligence that comes from machines and from data, and the power and intelligence that comes from people is very much also, I think, the solution for trying to create institutions that are themselves more innovative, themselves more innov uh, that are themselves more experimental, that are able to recognize new and creative ideas and break out of those conservative molds that were talked about, 
um, and to implement them to how they work. But is there a specific example yeah, that's of a technology that could help? Bhopal? Yeah, so I think so I think let me talk about, if I might, just a couple of examples. I think they fall really into these two categories that are well encapsulated in this phrase of the fourth industrial revolution. One is, of course, te technologies of data, and the other are the technologies really that of collective intelligence that help us connect with people. So take and, and let me give you examples of each. We I just came from a session in which somebody extolled the virtues of a machine learning, a data scientist, a scholar who is here and working on using big data techniques for annotating the entire scholarly literature on cancer, looking at all 22,000 journal articles that have been written to the end of you know, using big data machine learning techniques to help us accelerate the development of cures. Well, you know what, in India, without the benefit several years ago of some of these technologies, what the then head of science did was he created the open source drug discovery scheme for tuberculosis, and he got 3,000 students. Mm -hmm. Not students in big cities, but students in villages, again, annotating the literature and looking at every article that exists about TB, a neglected disease that drug companies have not wanted to work on because it affects mostly the poor. And now, after 40 years of no new advances in tuberculosis, thanks to the work of those 3,000 students, we're in clinical trials on the first new tuberculosis drug in 40 years. Mm -hmm. So I think there are good examples, on the one hand, of ways in which we're using data, and particularly mm -hmm. unlocking sources of government data, as in Mexico, where they've opened up data about schools and education, same thing in Tanzania. And you're able to spot the fact that 1,512 people on the payroll mm -hmm all have the same birthday, mm -hmm. and they all happen to be 102 mm -hmm. years old, and they all make more money than the president of Mexico. When you can use the data to do that, then you can spot the problems mm -hmm. and helpfully fix them and make institutions work better. Mm -hmm. But again, then people is the other side of the equation. So Jean-Philbert Niseguimana is here at Davos. He is the Minister of Youth and Technology from Rwanda, and he is building innovation centers in Rwanda, getting teenagers working on uh, developing new apps and new solutions, both to make government work better, to promote economic growth, and to promote social inclusion, tapping into the wisdom and talent that people have. Because our biggest asset in the end, in any culture, in any society, is going to be the people that live there. And we can use technology in part to help convene people, to help unlock that wisdom, and we can use uh, the combination of data plus people to hopefully create more effective and more innovative institutions. Let me stop Fantastic. with that. Tanvi, how does that sound to you? Good, but uh, so let me explain. I'm a civil servant from uh, government of India, working in the state of Madhya Pradesh, and currently posted in the city of Bhopal. Yeah. Uh, interesting. There are two interesting platforms which actually already do what uh, the speaker talked about. One of them is the CM Helpline Center, okay. in which any person. Any individual can actually call up the highest political executive of the state, get a grievance uh, uh, or complaint registered, ask for information, give suggestions, mm -hmm. and all that just use mobile technology. All of this is tracked online. There's a time escalation matrix, and a complaint or an issue is considered closed only after confirming the satisfaction of. Client. Great, thank now, you. Government is sitting on this huge data. So there's a great example from Uttar Pradesh of how a data platform can be used to get citizens' grievances online. It is actually, it does still sound third industrial revolution, actually. This sounds more like using digital. So I'm going to come to President Ilves from the former president of Estonia to ask to take up Cabello's question, which is can can countries in Africa leapfrog others to use the fourth <laughs> industrial revolution to help generate growth? Because in Estonia, as president, you used the third industrial revolution to leapfrog other countries. But what, what would your answer to um, our panelists in other countries be on that question? Well, one of the key, uh, key factors that allowed, allowed in my country to uh, to, uh, to leapfrog was um, an absence of legacy technology. We were so far behind. Um, but this actually led to a potential trap, which I always warn against, which is that in the rush to assist poor, my poor country, people were offering us uh, technology they were discarding 
and giving it us to, for us to free. And one of my big battles in 1993-94 was to convince the government, I wasn't present then, I was just a bystander in many ways, but not to take a 1979 analog telephone exchange from the city of Helsinki for free. Um, because my, I mean, the capital of my country had a 1938 telephone telephone exchange. So they said, well, look, this is a 40-year improvement. And I said, no, whatever you do, it may be free, but I mean, there's no point in getting an, a, a, an analog system uh, when everyone is going digital. Uh, and this is a general rule when it comes to, uh, to countries that are bootstrapping their way out, is do not take old discarded technology from these benefactors. Um, the other thing I say that what you what is um, I encourage countries always to be uh, brave. That is to say, just because others have done something before you one way, uh, trust your own people to do things differently. And we've had many experience, or we had many experiences with that in our own country. Where again, where I mean, another case where we had Swedish-run banks or rather we had Swedish banks that bought our banks and they came in and said, we'll teach you how to do electronic banking. And then when they saw what our own engineers had designed, they, they said, okay, you're coming now to work for us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So these are, so trust your people, trust and, and do what you think is right. The last thing I would say is that most of, my experience has been the most progress technologically uh, has nothing to do with technology uh, because the, the technology is like oxygen. It is all over and all around us. Whether we use it or not uh, tends to be or is almost always a function of legislation, policy, and regulation. Mm -hmm. The analog, Those are the analog um, uh, components of digital progress. Uh, if you have a government that is forward-looking, that says, let's do it, then you will end up with all kinds of great technology being used. If your government says, that's too risky, we don't want to do that, you won't have it. Um, and that was, uh, there's a book that, a big fat book that appeared about, well, just a year ago to, uh, this week, uh, which I co-chaired its production along with Kaushik Basu, the chief economist of the World Bank. And it's called Digital Dividends. You can download it for free. It's about 400 pages, <laughs> 500 pages. You know, I don't suggest you print it. Uh, but it's, if you just go to the World Bank homepage and look and, uh, and sort of in search, put in digital dividends, and it's a massive compendium of empirical studies done on what works and what does not work. And it comes. It starts off with this very same conclusion that progress, be it in the ba most basic hardware side of you know connectivity, cable, to the most sophisticated kinds of programs you can uh, do, that it really comes down just to legislation, regulation, and policy, all analog processes. Uh, Thank you, President Alves. So, really powerful message there. Um, for our panelists in different regions. The absence of technology could be, of legacy technology, could be your great asset. Um, don't take the offers of discarded technology, get the governance right. Now, by the way, I've, I failed to tell you to, to use the Twitter feed, the Twitter link, hashtag shaping Davos, to f send questions in from wherever you're sitting. Those of you in the room, you just wave your arms in the air, nice old-fashioned technology. Um, <laughs> but I think that, that where President Ilves left us on, on this governance issue is really important because it goes to Ashraf's concern about will the, the fourth industrial revolution technologies only benefit the 1% who can afford human enhancement, who can afford to introduce blockchain into their business model, who can afford to use artificial intelligence for all of its uses. Now, Anton Krachev, you're sitting in a technology park in, in Russia, um, in Kazan, in Russia. Um, how, how is that playing out in Russia? Like, how, how would you answer that concern of Ashraf's? So, uh, um, 
actually, Russia is a huge country. Everybody knows this. Mm -hmm. And uh, this huge means a lot of resources, but also it means a lot of challenges. Um, first of all, because of the uh, area, which is quite huge. And uh, this fourth industrial revolution progress means it, it can happen only if you have a very good infrastructure for mm -hmm. that. Uh, so basically, what has been done in Kazan, in Republic of Tatarstan, in one of the states of Russian Federation, it has been created a very high-level uh, infrastructure for implementing services, uh, for penetration of internet, mm -hmm. covering of 3G, fiber optics, and uh, I think that's one of the most important points why uh, Republic of Tatarstan become one of the most developed region in uh, implementing of IT in different spheres of economy and uh, attracting also a lot of human resources in all these processes. Uh, so uh, we think that this high technology park where I'm working for, where we have right now more than 140 companies, uh, but this initiative started only seven years ago, and seven years ago there was no a lot of understanding of uh, <coughs> Why do we need to uh, combine together different companies, mm -hmm. different people? But the synergy we created inside uh, made a lot of effects. And, um, and can I ask you, who's doing the disseminating? Your, your, your argument is compelling that you've got to make sure that people have access to the technology. Is it business in, in Kazan that's doing this? Or is it government? Or who, who's doing it? I think they're both. Mm -hmm. because uh, it cannot be only initiative of business or initiative of the government. Mm -hmm. Actually, business is more initiative than government in the mostly activities, mm -hmm. but uh, it's very important that government uh, should understand the role of new technologies, of the progress. Uh, so uh, the same as, for example, in Estonia, uh, the president, uh, his understanding, his vision of why do we need to use new technologies either to use uh, the free ones, mm -hmm. which are not a new one, but uh, his vision is very important. And that's what we have in our republic and vision of the head of the state, uh, president of the Republic of Tatarstan, mm -hmm. is absolutely important. Yeah. Because he totally supports every new efforts which we attract from uh, people, from students who come to our selections, to our business incubator programs mm -hmm. with their ideas. Sometimes these ideas are bad, sometimes they're very good. And our aim to connect them together. So that's what we're doing. We find out very nice ideas. It's sort of crowdsourcing of ideas uh, everywhere mm -hmm. and attracting and implementing them in different spheres of economy, not only in the government, of course, but also, yeah. uh, also in uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. Because uh, normally this gap between uh, somebody who has some idea mm -hmm. and uh, someone who can just implement it in mm -hmm. its uh, process, mm -hmm. uh, it's quite hard to... Yeah. to cover it. That's why we are working, that's what we are working for for these mm -hmm. seven years, and that's why right now in Republic of Tatarstan we have 240 electronic government services. It's quite mm -hmm. huge, and uh, the number of services used last year uh, was 83 million wow. during a year, and that's yeah. uh, with 3.8 million population, yeah. so a huge uh, integration of society in this process is very and absolutely important. Yeah. And I think it shows again this leapfrogging point in Uttar Pradesh and Tatarstan, you know, people leapfrogging. Question from here. I have a question. First of all, congratulations on this <coughs> effort and endeavor of initiating Davos and using the fourth industrial revolution to try to bridge the gap of our world. I think it's a great opportunity. To your comment, President, I mean, uh, the policies in the countries that have been pushed adoption really had an impact, and it's great. I have sort of a reverse question. We have not even implemented the fourth industrial revolution. We have the third almost done around the world, not yet. But it impacts the expectation of people about how the government is going to react. And policies typically or changing laws take a couple of years at least. So how do you think that in our democracies, because still the best system, as we know, in our democracies that we're going to try to use this improvement or speed and adjust in terms of policymakers and government, and how this is going to change the way we govern societies? And can I, can I bring this question and, and link it again to Ashraf's concern? You know, Beth, you sit in one of the wealthiest countries of the world, the United States of America. Mm -hmm. It's at the forefront of these new technologies. But if I look at some of the technologies in medicine, what's striking when you look at the United States is 
how small the percentage of the population that have access to them is. You know, it's fantastic to have state-of-the-art cures, but if they're only reaching 5% of the population, there's a challenge there. So how would you, you know, what, what's, what's the way forward on that? So I think uh, President Ilva's made it a very important point that those gaps, that lack of inclusion comes fundamentally is not from uh, the technology itself, obviously, but from the policies that we have in place that enable the economic practices that create that. So there's, you know, we, I do work also with the NHS in Britain, um, which is a much more democratic and distributed healthcare system uh, uh, that attempts to remedy some of those challenges of inclusion. But again, it comes back to the question here, which is how do we reinvent how we govern, how we make policy to take account of more voices. But give us a policy and, that works and, to but, distribute. But, so, let, so let me sort of give, make this a little bit more concrete, first in terms of the how, and then we can talk about the what. So what we're seeing evolving all over the world, and the US is not in the forefront here by any means, is what I would call the process of crowd law. So in other words, the process of enabling people, not just legislatures who sit in the legislature, but people outside to set the agenda for legislation, to participate in drafting the legislation, to comment on that legislation. We also see that in bureaucracies, the concept now of participatory bureaucratic governance. So it's not the referenda piece of just suggesting ideas or asking people how they feel about a policy, which we can see the consequences that that leads to, and frankly only provides information overload for already beleaguered people who govern. Rather, it's the practices that we're seeing, and you can take Brazil's example, where they uh, have formulated their technology legislation and regulation with a wide, Brazil has been at the forefront of this, with a wide array of input, enabling ordinary people, so to speak, who are not so ordinary. The people who are out here are us. We all have expertise, whether it's expertise that comes in the form of credentials, or whether it's expertise that comes in the form of lived experience, mm -hmm. or whether it's situational awareness or just a good idea. I think the challenge is, is that we lack those structures whereby we are asking people to do more than simply contribute their opinion. Rather, we need to start shifting to asking people what they know and how they can help mm -hmm. us. So going beyond on how do I feel, mm -hmm. to say, how do we actually do this? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the answer there is get, getting people involved. And I'm going to come back to but, both but Cabello getting and involved, Ashraf Getting this. involved in new, differently than we've been doing it up till now. Right. President Ilves, you've got... Uh, just, I mean, to answer the, your question and also to, to speak to this, um, you know, it's... Uh, government legislation can go quickly or it can go slowly. Uh, uh, wouldn't we, would you ask about how to make it faster? I don't know. I mean, we adopted a digital signature law and a, uh, and a secure two-factor authenticated uh, identity in 2002, and the ADOS directive in Europe is coming into effect right now, 15 <laughs> years later, uh, which, will, which in many ways forces some countries to do that same thing. In the United States, while the best technology comes out of the United States. There is no, there is no legally binding mm -hmm. legal signature, digital signature, which in fact inhibits the development of all kinds of things and keeps banking at a very, very primitive level, mm -hmm. for example, and unsafe. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, again, uh, and, and when I talk to people in the United States about, well, why don't you do this? They go, we will never have an identity Right. And I said, well, you have passports, you know, people travel with passports. I mean, there the state guarantees your identity. And they say, well, that's to go abroad. And I say, well, in fact, in the digital world, uh, the world comes to you. You don't have to cross a physical border. Um, and so there are sort of fundamental objections to things that, in fact, I mean, like an identity, like having laws that enable you to do all kinds of things with the technology that exists, but uh, but because of uh, whatever sort of innate conservatism, I don't even mean left or right, but just sort of mm -hmm. an unwillingness to do certain things, um, you end up with a paradox where other countries, mine for example, use to great effect technology that is developed in the United States but cannot be used there itself. Right, so, so the conservatism that you've told us about, Alexander, is not just in the university system, it's across government and governance. But how many of you here um, is that comforting to? Because of this, in Davos this year, there's been a lot of alarm about, for example, artificial intelligence leaping ahead too fast. So 
How many of you would like to see governments move quickly to regulate it? You, you're going to have to vote one way or the other, by the way. So how many of you think that you want to see governments move more quickly? And how many of you think it's a good thing that governments are slow to get their act together? So moving more quickly? OK, so that's quite a few of you. Leaving it alone, moving slowly at the moment? Yeah, so there's some of you. And sir, at the back, you would like to see it move slowly. Can you tell us why? Well, I think that innovation is always best left alone and not being mm -hmm. regulated. I, mm -hmm. I think that we have uh, a history uh, of, of regulating complex technologies, mm -hmm. and, and that ultimately dampens the innovation. It's, it's mm -hmm. actually much better to come from sort of from behind and, and regulate if things go haywire mm -hmm. instead of trying to sit and regulate it. Mm -hmm. from, because we will always, mm -hmm. or the regulatory policymakers mm -hmm. will always mm -hmm. guarantee be behind the scene, mm -hmm. be behind the, 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 the scene. And a comment here? So I'm an academic at Imperial College London, uh, Jerry Gorman. So I think there was a problem with the phrasing of your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that people have to accept that uh, the majority of people don't understand AI. Mm -hmm. And so I agree with the gentleman mm -hmm. here is exactly right. However, the government does need to move very fast on other things. Mm -hmm. So I love Beth's points. Mm -hmm. I think everything has to be about open access, mm -hmm. whether that's to journal, academic journals, for example. It has to be, but open should be in front of anything, including open access to data. Like, you know, pe people can't innovate very often because the data is not available. People won't give it to you. Even when you have a big institution like me, like, you know, you still, not me, but where I work, yeah, you still can't get access to the data. Government could really reduce the barriers there. So regulators, governments must be much more about how to reduce the barriers. And the other one then is uh, open source as well. If you want to talk about including people, then like open source uh, in terms of software has to be actively uh, supported. So we do uh -huh. have people like Google making TensorFlow, for example, available to allow technologists to, to develop new stuff uh -huh. and to be participate in the fourth industrial revolution. But like uh, government and other people could be supporting that much. Thank you. So a strong, strong argument here for open government and less regulation. Can I take this point here and then I'd like to... Uh, Dax Lovegrove Swarovski. Um, I, I do agree with the previous two points. I mean, the sharing economy is another example where things are moving rapidly. Mm -hmm. Uber has now flushed out what needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, but clumsy regulation coming in early is probably a, mm -hmm. not, not a good mm -hmm. thing. So I think when you look at the sharing economy and how it's being fixed uh, mm -hmm. carefully by smarter mm -hmm. regulation, that's a good mm -hmm. thing. So I wonder if there's a kind of principle-based regulation mm -hmm. that can yes. move a bit more mm -hmm. flexibly, fluidly, mm -hmm. rapidly mm -hmm. to, make, to guide a, AI. Mm -hmm. So each of you has got a comment on this. And, and you know, there's a, there's a paradox here. Does regulation, is regulation needed mm. to facilitate faster, better technology, or does it, does it always get in the way? So, so Beth, you wanted a, to... Sure, I think, each of us, I think each of us want to say something. Let me just try to connect some of these points, which is, uh, and start with your comment about what you call principled regulations. In other words, the idea of articulating principles rather than setting bright line rules about what not to do. So what we're all afraid of is setting the bright line rule, which says you may not do X or you may do Y, which leads to the the Uber problems, as you call it, or the fear that the first speaker or the first commenter brought up is that especially people in, in government who may lack knowledge about technology and for the, everybody else who doesn't know yet you know, where, what the standard is around which something is going to converge in a new market, it's too soon to set those bright line rules. What we do need is the principles, and that's where the openness comes in, where openness is very important, but also the responsible uses of technology and data, set of principles, and take the example of precision medicine, where Imperial is at the the forefront, you have a new center for the precision, precision mathematics of healthcare at Imperial, and we have a new precision medicine initiative in the US. What we're trying to do is to get beyond the comparable example in Europe, which is the knee jerk love, in the same way that we hate identity. Uh, Europeans love privacy, something we also, we also have some challenges on, but that sort of privacy reaction gets in the way often Absolutely. of open access and responsible uses of data. What's happening in precision healthcare is that we're saying, no, we have to start with some principles, which is open access, 
which is responsible, uh, which is security, which is responsible uses of data, which is to make sure that we're gathering data not simply from the usual suspects who are wealthy at one end of the spectrum, um, but we are gathering data, particularly in healthcare, from people who are underserved by the healthcare system, um, that we are respectful of how we use their data, that we use consent. These essentially the fair information access principles that were developed years ago help to inform how we think about how to do open in the right way. So in the same way that we have to get beyond um, our traditional kind of bright line approaches to a world of principles in which we're able to experiment and explore while respecting fundamental civil liberties and civil rights um, as we do these things. So I think that open is, is very much a piece of that coupled with mm -hmm. responsible uses mm -hmm. of data that allow us to do that principled regulation, setting the principles, and later we might get to those bright line rules when we yeah. really and you make, know what we're doing. You make an important point, which is open doesn't just happen. You actually need some governance around making sure that open really is informing and not just distorted slices. Um, right. There's a, a question coming in on Twitter is from Kapil Jain. What changes need to be made in existing educational system to make the up Coming workforce employable. Anton, you could. Yeah, uh, so I think uh, this is a discussion between uh, uh, implementing soft and digital skills in society. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday I've been on one breakfast here in Davos <laughs> and there was sort of discussion and uh, voting for uh, what is uh, the main lack of, uh, which, which is the lack of which type of uh, uh, knowledge is today for for professional leadership, for personal leadership, uh, uh, for government leadership. And uh, our, my opinion is that, uh, for example, if we take uh, young people from 50 to 15 to 25 years old, uh, they are quite involved in digital skills. So they know what is happening around. Uh, they are all in social society. They are all in smartphones. They uh, totally communicate online. Uh, but uh, and. I think that they have lack of soft skills today. Mm -hmm. And uh, soft skills is something that should be like basis for uh, everyone in the next 10, 20 years because of these new technologies which are changing very fast uh, need to be uh, realized by uh, people mind that you should need to learn all your year, uh, all, all your life and uh, you should not stop attracting knowledges. If you have uh, these soft skills, you will survive in this mm -hmm. uh, society. I mean, mm -hmm. growing in digital mm -hmm. society with a lot of new technologies. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you don't have these skills, uh, it will be quite hard for you even to uh, learn fast mm -hmm. to attract new knowledges. Mm -hmm. So that's why it, I think very important to understand this at the period of uh, a young people who is from seven years old and to maybe 12 years old, very young uh, children. Uh, and even new languages for coding, for developing, which are right now realized by us also. We uh, made some uh, courses for young uh, boys and girls from seven to 12 years old. Uh, they give us some new knowledge and new opportunities, which uh, basically are not in schools. Normally, I mean, uh, in Russia and also, I mean, I think in most of the countries, uh, the only exception is maybe Japan, who is right now implemented uh, programming as a basic, um, basic uh, degree in the school, uh, and so. Art vision is Finland school model. So my opinion is that we need to pay more attention for school education and uh, that's, that's very important because of the uh, next future and because all the new ideas mostly come from uh, students, uh, from universities, from people who uh, have some new vision mm -hmm. for some difficult problems mm -hmm. that has been never faced before. So. Great, so, so Anton's advice to our panelists is, you know, get coding, I guess. Get, get them all coding. Something like this. But I'd like to, President, could I? Can I answer that could, question, please? Yes, but can I, can I get no, your... No, answer no, but the, 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 something that we've left hanging, and I'm thinking of our panelists here. Beth has told us about this bottom-up mm. participatory process, but your success in Estonia, it strikes me, was leadership from the top. So I'm thinking, you know, people around the world listening to this are probably wondering, well, if we're gonna if we're gonna really harness these technologies and use them, which way should we go? You've done it. Do first you I'll mix answer those the first two? question. Yep. 
I'm 63. Mm. I learned to code 49 years ago. I was taught how to program in BASIC. <laughs> uh, and, I, and one of the reasons, and later on, I've been coding. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I can think in these terms yeah. is that a group of us, in a very bizarre experiment, were taught how to code in 1968. Yeah. Mm. I would say that here, yeah. all I mean, kids should learn to code. Sure. And that was the first step yeah. that we pushed through in Estonia. And Estonia, in fact, has as part of its yeah. curriculum is teaching mm -hmm. kids to code. Because otherwise, we have, a, you know, we have a very good foreign language learning program. And all I and to push it through, I say, look, it's learning a foreign language with no regular verbs. Mm. That's what coding is, right? It's <laughs> uh, so do that, mm. and that is absolutely necessary because, in fact, the, uh, with the with technology coming into everything, we are more impinged upon technology than ever before. Uh, I would also recommend everyone to read an essay by C. P. Snow called mm. "The Two Cultures." which is about the sort of the problem of the British University in 1959, because he was a literary novelist and a physical chemist, who basically, mm -hmm. summing up this essay, says the problem was he was the only person who could walk from, from the dinner table with the physicists and chemists to the table with, drinking with the poets and the novelists. <laughs> Um, but he said that's the problem of the university. Today, that is the problem of society. Mm -hmm. We, the geeks, don't know how to talk to the legislators. The legislators or politicians don't understand what the hell is going on. Um, and I, I think that, uh, and which leads, leads to lapses on both sides. The geeks not quite understanding what is part of the sort of enlightenment tradition of human rights, uh, fairness. Uh, well, privacy is a somewhat later concept. It's only from the 1890s, but anyway. But can I take you to the problem that Tanvi and Ashraf face, right? They want to be able to harness the fourth industrial revolution for growth in their country. And they're getting two different answers from this panel. One is vision from the top, make it happen. And the other is participatory governance. Go and start getting communities to talk. Which way would you advise them to go? Well, I would do both. I mean, you just uh, elect oh, yourself people who who are willing, open to ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I get credit for a lot of stuff I didn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but, uh, Enjoy it. <laughs> but I, but I would encourage people yeah, to listen. You listened. I, so, that's a <laughs> so Ashraf, how does that sound to you? Um, I think both both options are uh, are. A valid, it's just a matter of uh, timing. If it, there is a vision from the top, things will definitely go faster. If not, it's going to take you a lot of time to do more of a community organizing. And then the issue is the most outspoken, who are not necessarily the smartest or the ones who, are, who understand the situation better, will be the ones actually speaking on behalf of the others. And then um, I think I totally agree with the, this issue of languages. In Tunisia, I remember when we organized the first hackathon when we brought geeks, I want them to work on, on coding a platform, helping whistleblowers and helping citizens to um, whistleblow and to report corruptions. Mm -hmm. They did not get it because they were somehow, they internalized the idea that they are going to the market, they are going to sell products, that they want to go to startups, which creating these different languages. Mm -hmm. And the problem is maybe geeks, they master the, the coding languages more they master their own languages. That's why if we had maybe some of them joining our, our initiatives to advocate and lobby for a better ecosystem, of a, for a better um, use of technology, that would be more efficient. Because some, someone like me, I've been involved with a number of um, ICT for development initiatives, but I'm not a geek myself. It's just that I understand a little bit what the geeks would say, but my background is coming from civil society and then someone who believes in the role of technology in raising awareness, in holding governments accountable, launching websites like Shehed Meter to track the performance of the Shehed, who is the Tunisian prime minister, I think is, is there in Tavos still. Um, so these are the type of things we've been trying to do, but I think it's time for People not to wait for governments. They sh they need to take the lead and make the change with the tools they have and mobilize and get more and more resources. But for me, I still believe with a 
a clear political vision and a full support from a, a political uh, leader or institution, things will will be faster. And I think it's things are going so fast that if you miss one second or one decision today, that would cost you a couple of years or decades even no. in the future. No. Thank uh, you. Can I answer that one thing mm. quickly? I mean, I'll give you an example mm. of uh, one thing that came out of Estonia that now is in over 100 countries, which is called Let's Do It World. You can look it up. You can Google it. Um, basically, the, ki the, the, the guys who developed Skype, who are Estonians, got together with people concerned about the ecology, and they devised a free app for smartphones to locate garbage. And then, uh, then they developed also a, a logistics program to clean it up. <coughs> and we had this massive cleanup campaign. And it helped that the president came out and did it too. So you have a little support. But I, it, wasn't my, I mean, it wasn't my idea. It was purely civil society uh, sort of hanging out with geeks to come up with this thing that is so wildly successful. It's done in, I guess, the last count, 107 countries around. So if you, you can Google it, let's do it world. But it's purely a civil society initiative combined with technology com uh, and mm -hmm. combined with technological knowledge. Uh, and of course, it got a boost because it had political support from the top. But it doesn't have to be, it's not the political leadership saying, now you go do it. It's more like, well, I'm going to go clean up too, you know, and so <laughs> that helps. So, Cabello, you're getting some advice here on how, you know, you can help Botswana leapfrog, you know, get everybody coding, don't accept old technology, yeah. think about the leapfrog, get communities involved, yeah. make sure some of your leaders are digital literate. Does it sound useful to you? No, no, very much so. I mean, I think um, if I just, you know, you take us back slightly, um, you know, one of the things that we actually talked about is actually policy should follow, should follow practice. And I think, you know, that also is true if you talk about regulation and about and about legis legislation. So it, it, it should be an environment whereby, um, you know, people, you know, be it, be it a business or be it civil society, um, are, are, are free to come up with it you know, high, high ideas. I think the, the point that has just been talked about around leadership, um, you know, I think it's very, very key. Um, you know, back to the president's point, um, uh, Botswana, luckily, and maybe for us, it's been a bit of a curse. Um, you know, we have um, bought uh, many, many um, uh, government systems, um, your oracles, your SAPs, um, high-end systems at a time where the users uh, or, or, or the implementers were not actually ready to actually use it. So, you know, we now have a, a situation where in some instances we have, you know, almost white elephant high-end technology which is sitting there waiting to be to be to be leveraged, mm -hmm. which now then jumps to the point around workforce. Um, you know, and, and, and I think it's actually quite key linking all those things. Um, you know, we we, we we have multiple issues, multiple challenges, but, but I think, you know, there is no right or wrong answer. I, I think for me, doing something um, is actually the big thing. Um, um, you know, if, if you have if you have government government leadership, I think that is that is actually great, um, and it will definitely make things move a lot faster. Um, you know, and, and and I think also we are seeing are seeing governments, um, you know, more so ours actually responding to to what civil society is doing. Um, you know, if you you know look at now, you know we now, and it's and it's and it might sound like a like a very normal thing, you know, Western world, but our government is now partaking a lot in things like Twitter, Facebook, purely because the uh, uh, civil society will reach Twitter and Facebook to talk about government. So you know that has actually driven a a a, a policy because practice has dictated that the governments play in that space. I think you, you give us a, an important warning, actually. Um, which is a slightly different point to President Ilv's point. But it's, you don't always want to buy the front-end technology. I'm thinking of public financial management systems. I can think of a small Pacific island that, that mm. paid hugely for the state-of-the-art one. And it sat on shelves because they didn't have computers that could run it. <laughs> and they were paying several million dollars a year for mm. the maintenance yes, charges on software they weren't using. And I would contrast that to what Ashraf Ghani did in Afghanistan when he was finance minister, which is get them all to use Excel, because that's the technology they could use, and that's the technology that their systems could use. So I guess 
you know, highest tech isn't always the solution, but it's also, you know, but I, I think as a, it nevertheless stands, President Ilves' point, that don't, don't let somebody else fob you off with a technology that will, that will hold you back. <laughs> now, other comments from the audience. We started with this, how, to, how can countries use this revolution? Yes. <coughs> Do introduce yourself, and here's a microphone. <coughs> My name is James Mori. I'm from Kenya. Mm -hmm. I'm an investment company in Kenya. I'm interested in the views of the panel on the extent to which governments can apply the technologies coming from the fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. to improve government processes and also reduce corruption. Might we see yeah. Yeah. a time when government registries and customs borders are manned by robots because that reduces the room for human discretion and mm -hmm. asking for bribes? Mm -hmm. I'm just interested in, in the views of it. But tell us, you've got, a, you've got your own answers there, which I think are interesting. Just tell us a little bit what your top two would be. It's, you just mentioned using robots instead of bureaucrats to avoid corruption. <laughs> yes, that's 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 okay, so one, that's, that's, that's one that's, idea. That's one suggestion. And to the extent to which we can use artificial intelligence mm -hmm. in, in processes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that then you mm -hmm. can you can build in the process mm -hmm. and, 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 and avoid mm -hmm. the room for for human discretion because that's mm -hmm. where the, the real problem is and the challenge we have with a lot of uh, developing countries mm -hmm. is because of corruption mm -hmm. and those particular issues. Social mm -hmm. social inequality mm -hmm. is expanding. Are you sure you can't program a robot to take bribes? I want to hear from you. <laughs> right. Excellent. There are, I'm going to take just a couple of comments from the audience and then bring the, bring the, the panellists back in. Yes. Hi, I'm Greg Metcraft, the Chairman of the Australian Securities Investments Commission. And uh, also, interesting, I was the Chairman of the of IOSCO, the International Organisation of Securities Commission, which covers 120 countries. And I, I do think that you know, policymakers or regulators can create the right environment. Sorry, can you speak up slightly? Sorry. Yeah. I think yeah. Policy, I think that regulators can actually create the right environment to encourage innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that's really important. So, for example, um, in Australia, you know, at ASIC, we have created an innovation hub that actually allows startup operators to come in and uh, work with them if they're wanting to operate in, in the financial services sector. We actually say to them, don't go and talk to lawyers, come and see us directly. We can tell you what you can do, what you can't do. Because a lot of the time, they just don't understand the, the, the system. And secondly, another example is we have a digital advisory committee which is actually made up of startup operators who actually tell us what, what their problems are and how we can help them. So I think that engagement with the startup operator is another way of just creating the right environment. Another thing we do is actually we now have a regulatory sandbox where people, we allow people who haven't actually got a financial licence to actually deal with a limited number of people, mm -hmm. say 100, mm -hmm. for a period to see whether the business actually works or mm -hmm. not. So again, creating that opportunity to actually trial something which is important. Mm -hmm. and a number of jurisdictions actually have that. And I think that's a good way of embracing what we're talking about. Another uh, really th interesting thing we're doing now is a data lab where we allow start operator operators to actually come and actually use real data to actually perhaps text, um, you, you know, reg tech type proposals mm -hmm. or others which are, you know, can be used. And then finally, is international cooperation. We have a, an intelligence hub globally through OASCO where with emerging markets, etc., we exchange ideas as to what is happening. And also, um, Australia, we've actually signed cooperation agreements with other similar-minded jurisdictions where startup operators in one jurisdiction can actually move into another jurisdiction. So, for example, we've signed one with Kenya uh, to allow, you know, because there's some really interesting stuff being developed in Kenya. So I do think... Mm -hmm. You can be proactive and create the right environment to this. You can either do nothing mm -hmm. and be reactive, or mm -hmm. you can actually be proactive and forward-looking and create the right environment. And it's for no reason mm -hmm. other than we actually think we're focused on actually creating the right mm -hmm. And are there any other answers in the room to, to our friend from Kenya's question? How could governments use the fourth industrial revolution technology? I don't think you even need a fourth. I mean, uh, I mean, one of the things that, uh, uh, well, this is also unfortunately a true story, but uh, I've been going around proselytizing for years, telling countries, you know, use open source, develop this stuff. We'll give you, we'll give you the operating system that we develop for ourselves. And I would always say, and one of the great advantages is you can't bribe a computer. And then uh, the, uh, and I would do this at, with, you know, w one of my advisors would be sitting there, and then finally one of them said to me, stop saying that. And I said, why? He said that when you say that to certain leaders, they, their reaction or their advice is like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, 
Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> do that. Yeah. So, but it is. I mean, you don't need fourth. Yeah. You don't need. Uh, I mean, sure, you want to get yeah. you put your data on blockchain. Fine. But but the point is having financial records transparently, you know, available mm. to people to observe. Mm -hmm. That cuts down a lot of corruption. And but, we, but I think so. I think most people are aware of the of the steps you can take using digital government. We've had some wonderful examples during today's mm -hmm. debate. But what about the fourth industrial revolution technologies? Yeah, yeah Anton. Can I, can I uh, just a, a little bit getting back to the question of the government and uh, fourth industrial revolution. So sure, government has a lot of opportunities right now to implement different mm. progress of fourth industrial revolution technologies <coughs> that already exist. Blockchain, it could be, it could change actually all the system of communication between citizen and government, also inside government, how it, how it happens. Uh, robotics uh, is changing healthcare, uh, so different types of them. But I, I think for government, this, this is a opportunity for in two different ways. One way is to understand these technologies. And this is a very important point because that's what you uh, just thought about, what, what is happening around. Because these uh, young geeks who create these technologies, who understand and make progress in them, they do it uh, very fast. If you don't understand what is it, uh, you just cannot implement it. That's, this is very basic and simple. But uh, and, and this is the first point, and uh, my opinion is that any government uh, officials, they just, just should, should, they should today, uh, take some maybe special courses, uh, just like, for example, Singularity University mm -hmm. making or in, giving an understanding mm -hmm. of what is happening around. Mm -hmm. But the second one is uh, 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 what, what is important for the government is to understand that, uh, for example, AI uh, and rob robotization of uh, industry can create a huge problem of uh, uh, job, job less, job cuts in, in the economy, uh, and what all this stuff, all these people will do if uh, robotization will reduce labor force for 50, 60 percent next five years, uh, especially. And, and this is a great challenge for governments today. So they should understand it from the both way. One way is to implement these technologies, and the second way, what is uh, the challenge after implementing it, not only by government, but also, but also by companies, because business will make it absolutely. Business wants to, make, to be efficient. And so all this progress will be realized in the companies. And that is the way of, uh, we discussed a little bit previously about regulation. Should government mm -hmm. just understand these technologies and put some basic level regulations just not to make crash in the economy? And I see Ashraf's got a quick comment on that. Ashraf? Yeah, the, um, for me, like most of the times we talk about the fourth uh, revolution, but at the same time, we never ask about the pre-requirements, what we need before mm -hmm. shifting uh, to that, and then mm -hmm. again, like we need to remember that s most of the people living on Earth now, they're still traumatized by a previous dictatorship, or they're still living under a dictatorship. And then um, the digital era is a bit also digital to the people, but also I see it in myself. Like people, they don't have trust in in online uh, in online sources and tools because they think that big big brother is still watching them. So I think. Yeah. Democracy and fostering democracy is really as important as uh, the fourth uh, the digital era because I think we take for granted that it's a democracy. It's not. And that's why sometimes maybe a post-colonial approach to it that we need to think from the south about how we need to shift towards this fourth uh, revolution because what I'm seeing is we are still putting the West in the center of it. They take for granted that what they share as values are universally shared, which is not really the case. And that's why we need maybe to think again from a purely post-colonial angle to this, maybe. Thank you. Alexander, what's your takeaway from this discussion? Um, my understanding is that uh, we are mostly speaking about technologies, and I would like to put forward some ideas about the, the man at this environment. So to my understanding, the fourth industrial revolution is mostly about the new citizens of the new uh, age rather than the technologies that are around us. So we can deal with the technologies, but we would like to have the human-like robots rather than the uh, robot-like humankind in the future. <laughs> so speaking about the universities and uh, 
about the new curriculum that is, should be put forward by the fourth uh, industrial revolution, we should be very careful about, so to say, the low track of uh, um, science and education and short track. So uh, we should be prepared uh, uh, with the risks. We should uh, uh, generate the new education, the new educators for this era. And uh, well, uh, I'm not sure that everybody is prepared as the universities right now, but it is a challenge and we should follow the challenge and we should take these risks because mm -hmm. uh, in our country, it's quite obvious that uh, we have some governmental regulations and government help with uh, proceeding with the fourth industrial revolution, as my colleague said. And it's quite a, uh, a local agenda to have both industries, universities, and local governments in one branch, say, to promote the ideas, to make it uh, uh, realization quite fast, mm -hmm. and uh, to make the proper changes in the society. So it's a kind of synergy that really need. And, uh, the other thing is that we should go to high school right now <laughs> and then to universities. <laughs> right. Just for those who will live after us, will be prepared properly. <laughs> Excellent. So look, we started today, Tanvi started us off with a terrific question, which is, is it the fourth industrial revolution that most countries need, or is it a bigger dose of the third industrial revolution, the digital one? And I think one of the answers of today's panel is that it's the third. You know, the examples that Beth, that President Ilves, that Anton have given us are great examples of applying digital technology to help governments be more participatory, to do better, to be more efficient. I think that's important. And I think it, it does reinforce President Xi Jinping's point that we don't yet see the fourth industrial revolution as a driver of growth. The promise is there for Cabello's question about leapfrogging, and I think President Ilves gave you some ideas about what makes it so possible to leapfrog. The concerns about access and e equity which were raised, I think Beth has given us some really interesting ideas around how you can create participatory governance to anchor technologies in communities and to make sure that they do serve whole communities. I think both Alexander and Anton highlighted the need to shake up the way we're training people for the workforce. And some of the Twitter questions are exactly focused on that. How do we train the workforce to keep up? So let me just finish with 30 seconds from each panelist on when is the last lesson that you, what, when, when did you last take a quick lesson on the latest technology? Beth. <clears throat> I'm getting a lesson right now. I'm following the Twitter feed. <laughs> and, as a <laughs> and as a result, it's not the technology that I'm learning, but I'm getting fascinating insights, opinions, questions from people all over the world whom we've heard from here, whom we're hearing, whom I'm watching also yeah. on my phone. And I think the point is, is that whether it's about third or about fourth, what we need is mm -hmm. institutions that can help our values to keep up with the technology. Anton. I think my last lesson, sure, this is where, but uh, also I had one meeting about one month ago in the Lyceum locally in Kazan for talented guys. Yeah. Uh, they are about from 12 to 15 years old. And the lesson was to, was my understanding that they know much more than me mm -hmm. in different <laughs> technologies. Right. Uh, this is not just something very unique for them. This yeah. is normal. They understand it just like as mm -hmm. for me, just taking pen and write down something. They this is not something that they want to confuse about. Mm -hmm. So this is the best le uh, lesson we should yeah. think about right now, because this is our future. And in 10 years, these guys, they will create it. And President Ilves, you learned to code before the Global Shapers community was born. Um, are you learning about quantum computing now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yes, I'm worried about quantum computing, uh, actually, because so much of what we we do is um, uh, in terms of encryption, which is key to privacy, could easily be out the window in five or ten years, mm -hmm. and if and we, there's no substitute for it. So I'm, I mm -hmm. I follow that. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say what I'm what I've been surprised by is the the speed with which uh, the whole blockchain dis uh, distributed mm -hmm. ledger discussion has proceeded because it. I went around for years talking about 
basically saying in this in regard to the privacy discussion and you guys are worried about privacy uh, privacy is, is someone finding out your blood type but you should be and you may not like it but you should be worried about it data integrity because that means someone's changed your blood type in the records and that's a lot worse um, and now it's, and I'm here at Davos, and it seems everyone is talking about blockchain mm -hmm. data integrity. So I'm, I'm very happy, but surprised that it went so quickly. Fantastic. Can I ask you all to join me, not just thanking the panelists, not just thanking our participants mm. from around the world, which has really enlivened this meeting, but thanking the whole Global Shapers community, and Yemi is the champion who's sitting in this room, for a wonderful, and, and the WEF, for a wonderful initiative that's bringing an energy and a set ide of ideas to the World Economic Forum, which I think is really important for the next generation. So join me in thanking those groups.